Welcome to the final lecture of the course. Last time I introduced Fock and Gontorov's cluster varieties, defined as gluing different cluster seed tori through the cluster mutation considered as birational isomorphisms between varieties. So today I will give an overview of its application, or actually Fock and Gontorov's original motivation to the theory of higher tight theory. So this topic today is quite technical, so I will try to skim over the details and may not be very precise. You are encouraged to consult the original literature or other survey articles for more details. So recall what we did for Tachmeter space. So this is the moduli space parametrizing the complex structure or the hyperbolic structure of a marked surface. And one of the definitions is given by looking at the collection of homomorphism of the fundamental group of your surface to the group PSL to R. <clears throat> and we want to consider the moduli space, so we identify the action of the, co the conjugation by PSL to R on the image on the image. And this homomorphism is also a little bit special. So we require the homomorphisms to be uh, find, uh, faithful, discrete, and also parabolic around the punctures. <coughs> so the image of the loop of each loop around a non-trivial, the image of a non-trivial loop should be a parabolic element in PSL. And this will give you a discrete subgroup called the fusion group. Of PSL to R. Right. So to in order to generalize this to a higher rank, so the natural thing will be to replace the group PSL by some other arbitrary groups. So we want to replace the G by higher order split semi-simple algebraic groups. <clears throat> and then we consider this as our higher time meter theory. So here Split basically means that you can talk about a maximal torus inside your group, which is contained in some Borel subgroup. So this is a split maximal torus, so it should be isomorphic to some multiplicative group to some power, which is the rank of our G. So this is the Borel. And if you don't like this language as usual, then you can always consider SLN as your example. The Borel to be the upper triangular or lower triangular, and the Messier torus to be the diagonal matrix. So you can always keep this as your example. So <clears throat> it turns out that to define higher time theory, which means to define the collection of homomorphisms from pi 1s to g up to this conjugation, there is an equivalent description using the language of g local system. And in fact, this is exactly what we will refer to when we talk about higher Tachmuller theory, which is to study the moduli space of G local system. So define as follows. So a G local system, which I denote by L on your surface S, is a principal G bundle with a flat connection. A very simple definition. So in a very layman term, if you have a surface, then <coughs> a G bundle is a is like a vector bundle, but instead of a vector space associated to each point, each bundle will look like G. 
So you have a for each point you have a G and for a neighborhood you have a G cross that neighborhood in the, in the sense of trivialization. So if you go around the surface under some non-trivial loop, say on a torus around some non-trivial loop, then if you start from a point on your G bundle and you do the standard parallel transport along the bundle, you will end up at usually some other point on the same bundle, and this will be differed by some element in the group G. So the point that this <coughs> principal G bundle has a flat connection means that this G here will be well defined for all the points of the bundle. So in particular, we can say that it is in one-to-one -one correspondence to homomorphisms of pi 1 s to g. Transport around non-trivial loops. So given <coughs> a G bundle, we walk around the parallel transport along a non-trivial loop and we will get an element of G. So this will define the homomorphism from a loop to an element of G. And the fact that the bundle is flat, it has a flat connection means that this is a well-defined homomorphism. And you can also uh, go back when you define a homomorphism from pi 1 s to g, it will uniquely define you a g local system. <clears throat> so this is the collection, and of course we want to study moduli space. And so in our setting, we just let g act on the right by multiplication. For the for the G bundle. <laughs> and equivalently in the homomorphism setting, then it means acting by conjugation on the image. So we mod out by this uh, G action and we consider the moduli space of G local system. In any case, this uh, remark here is precisely the philosophy behind how we generalize the usual type illuminal space to higher rank or arbitrary G. And somehow we actually kind of forget about these conditions. We just look at <coughs> uh, any homomorphisms and study this moduli space. So <coughs> given a G local system, we can also consider the associated bundles because I mean each fiber looks like G, so you can have some G action, and with this G action you can define other uh, principal bundles or other other bundles, and the choice will be the Borisov group and the unipotent radical. So we let B be a Borisov group. and you, the unit, unit potent radical. So in the previous lectures, I used N instead of U, but here I will follow the convention in the literature. So if G is SLN, then you can think of B as, again, upper triangular matrix, then U will be the upper triangular matrix with one on the diagonal. So the language of associate bundle is the following. So for any space X with a G action, we can form an associate bundle. L of X. So by definition, this is the <coughs> fiber product. L cross X. <clears throat> so intuitively, you can think of each fiber 
it looks like oh, it looks like the opposite of the g action on x <clears throat> remember the fiber of your g local system is just just looks like g just looks like g and then you act that g on your space x so the associated bundle will have each byte fiber looks like the opposite the the collection of opposite of the g action on your space x in particular for our choice we will let curly b be the flat variety g mod b then the associated bundle is called the associated flat bundle L of B and for the unipotent reticle we also have the principal affine space then the associated bundle will be known as the associated principal flat bundle flat bundle which I did by L of a. <clears throat> so if you are not again not familiar with the language of flat variety, you can treat this as the collection of flags. So when you take G mod B, what you are interested in will be a vector space, a collection of vector space spaces. So that successively it will provide you the sequence of the space of your uh, CN in, in case when G is S or N, say. So if you have, say, N bases, then you will get a sequence of subspace where each of them is spanned by the all the previous bases. And the last one will be the whole space, and the first one will be the trivial thing. And G mod B will parameterize all such collection. So similarly for <coughs> G mod U, so when you mod out U, which means you don't mod out the size of the vector. So we still have the similar picture, but instead you also care about this, the length of your uh, basis. So in the setting of principal affine space, we will care about also the length. So we really care about is the batch product of the of the basis. So here we just uh, for for the flat right here, we just care about the 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 basis itself without the size. So this will generate this will generate VK. And here we also we also span VK, but we also record the size of each basis because we don't mod out the size in U. <clears throat> All right, so this is the associate bundle and then the space that we are interested in will be defined using these two associated bundle. So the first space is the frame G local system. So there's some slight technical condition. For this definition, we need G to have trivial center. So for example, you can take PSL instead of SL. Then it has trivial center because for P you mod out the center. <clears throat> so in this case, a framed G local system. On S is a G, G local system. Together with a flat session. of your associated flat bundle restricted to the boundary components of your surface.
So remember, <coughs> I kind of missed the notation, but when we talk about the surface S, we have a marked points and punctures on the surface. So the marked points may be punctured if it is interior or it will lie on the boundary. Then the marked point will cut the boundary into uh, components. So those boundary cutting out by the mark point, I will refer to those as punctured boundary. And then we have the associated bundle, LB, and we restrict this bundle to the punctured boundary. So punctured boundary will be some disjoint sets, right? If your surface is a circle with three mark points, then the punctured boundary is just three segments, which means you will have three local uh, sections on each boundary. <clears throat> and it is flex section, and this boundary is contractible, so it is just a local function. It's just a it's just locally constant function. Um, let me just draw this. Yeah. So. Frame G local system will be G local system together with this extra information of a flex section on the punctured boundary. And the X space, which I divided by XGS, will be the moduli space of frame local uh, of frame G local system. Yes. Again, the moduli space is with respect to the G action on the G local system L. <clears throat> so this gives us the X story, and we also need to talk about the A story. And this is defined by another, yet another uh, decorated G local system. So G local system with some extra data, and again our G needs to have some uh, additional technical condition. So here I let something called GS to be omega zero W zero bar square. So remember we have the longest element of the while group. And we lift this element to an to a representative in G, given by this uh, pinning of one zero negative one, and you multiply all the uh, all the <coughs> phi i according to the uh, reflections. So this is an element in the G, which is the normalizer of the torus. Let's say GT. Anyway, so you have a representative of G, so please refer to the double Bruhat cell ledger. And then we take the square of that and we call this SG. And the requirement is that, oh, the, F, the observation is that SG actually has order two, at, at least two, at, at most, order at most two. So, if the SG element is actually trivial, then we can define the decorated G local system. On S, so again, it is G local system. And this time together with a flag session of L of A instead. So this is a this is a technical condition and it turns out that if SG is not E, we can still modify the definition a little bit and consider what's called the twisted local system. But otherwise, the structure is more or less similar.
<clears throat> and we will just focus on this this special case here. So just like the X side, we define the A side to be the moduli space of decorated G local system on S. <clears throat> So we have the X side, we have the A side, then naturally we will want this to coincide with what we did from the lecture last week, uh, sorry, two days ago on the cluster ensemble. So let me write down the theorem by fucking Goncharov. So if G is simply connected and G prime is the adjoint form, <clears throat> so adjoint form means the image of G under the adjoint action. So if you have G, you can add on itself by the conjugation and the image of such an action inside <coughs> the automorphism of G will be the adjoint form of G, denoted by G prime. And this by definition has trivial center. So with this setup, then the G space with G prime and the A space with G will form a cluster ensemble. <clears throat> so, as an example connecting to the previous lectures, if we take G to be SL2C, then the corresponding adjoint form will be PGL. Then the A space and you write it on the positive real points will be exactly Penner's decorated type middle space. Or I mean the the, the type middle, the decorated type middle space we talked about previously. The X space you write it on the positive points will be a 2 to the n to 1 cover of the standard type middle space. So this 2 to the n cover is actually just the type middle space together with a choice of orientation of the boundary components. So n here is the number of boundaries of your surface. <clears throat> so in particular, the image of this x space under the forgetful map. So remember the X space is the framed G local system, is the G local system together with some information on the boundary. But if you consider only the G local system, then this image will be identified with the type middle space. And the coordinate is given by Thurston's shear coordinate. So this connects to the previous lectures and the higher type middle theory will be a direct generalization of the classical type middle theory. So now the next goal is to what is to study explicitly the description of this X and A cluster variety. So in particular, what we want to do is to, to give it the description of some coordinates. So in the Classical type of the theory, we have the lambda lengths and we have the shear coordinates for SL2. 
So here it turns out that for higher rank, the coordinate will come from uh, the positive structure of the double blood, the big double blood cells that we talked about in part three of this course. So I, we don't have the videos for that, but you can still look at the natural notes on campus. So in order to do the description of coordinates, we have to start with some observation. So given a marked surface, we will fix a triangulation just like before. Then it turns out that given a cluster ensemble associated to each triangle of your triangulation, we can glue them together. So the technical term is amalgamate. So we can amalgamate the cluster ensemble associated to each triangle to give a cluster ensemble associated to the whole surface. <clears throat> so remember the cluster ensembles are really described by quivers locally in the torus. <clears throat> and so here, when we say amalgamate two cluster ensembles, what we really do is to glue the quiver together. And more precisely, what we want here is that for each triangle of the surface, we will associate, it, we will associate a quiver to this triangle. And then we glue the quiver along the boundary of <clears throat> along the boundary frozen vertex lying on the edge of the triangle. So yeah, more precisely, if you have a triangle, then previously we associate to this some quiver and on the boundary this will be frozen vertex and now if you have some other triangle in your triangulations then what you do is you glue the <coughs> vertex uh, you glue the quiver together and then at the end you will defrost the common vertex that you glue so this will become a non-frozen vertex in your graph. So here we'll go along boundary frozen vertex and then defrost. So this is the general picture. And so for higher rank, instead of this simple quiver, you'll have some other more complicated quiver associated to the triangle. And you will have more frozen uh, vertex on the boundary. And then when you glue, you will defrost all the common frozen boundary on the edge that you are gluing. And in this way, you will get a new quiver. And this new quiver will be the new cluster, uh, will give you the new cluster ensemble associated to the two triangle case. And in general, if you have a triangulation on your surface, then by just gluing such quiver will give you the structure of cluster ensemble on the whole surface. And not only that, because for a triangulation of S, we know that we can also obtain other triangulation through a flip of diagonal. And it turns out that the change of triangulation through the flip of di diagonals is just given by the sequence of cluster mutation. So in the simple case, when you have the standard rank one quiver that we are familiar with, then flip of triangulation corresponds to a quiver mutation at the at the boundary uh, at the glued vertex here. So if you mutate at this vertex, <coughs> then the quiver will correspond to flipping the diagonal. 
And in general, this is also true that for this funny, complicated quiver, and if you are flipping the diagonal, then what you did will be to mutate this quiver in some way, and it will be compatible. So with this observation, then it is enough to study the X and G, X and A variety associated to triangle, to a single triangle. And once we know this structure or the description of the coordinate associated to a triangle, then we can use this gluing process to glue all these X and A uh, cluster variety pieces into the thing correspond to the whole surface. So we just need to focus on the triangle case, which means a disk with three marked points and no punctures. Okay. So now, from now on, our surface S will be a disk with three marked points. Which, is, which means a triangle. So if S is a disk with three mark points, then what is the X space? Well, because this is a disk, it is contractible, everything is trivial, the fundamental group is trivial, so we don't, so a local G system is just <coughs> nothing, it's a trivial constant. So the only information that we need will be the framed <coughs> Data, which means the flex session on the boundary components. And in this case, remember we have three boundary components. So the X space, the modernized space of framed G local system, is nothing but the space of configuration of points in the flag variety. And because we have three boundary components, we have three points. So this is the configuration of three points, <coughs> or in other words, G mod B to the power three. And because we're talking about modularized space, we want to mod out the common uh, multiplication of the group by G on the left. So, so we we consider the configuration of three points in the flat variety, and we mod out the G action by multiplication on the left. Again, because this is a disk, so it is trivial in terms of the local system, and restrict to the boundary, we have three boundary components, and each flat session means a choice of elements of the flat G mod B. So we need to choose three elements from G mod B, and we mod out the overall action by multiplication on the left by the same group G. <coughs> so equivalently, this means that we can place a flag on each vertex of a triangle. <clears throat> so this, this triangle is not the same as this triangle because we are placing G mod B on each boundary components. So we are viewing the vertex of this triangle as the boundary components. Oops. So we can represent things like this. we are placing three flags on a triangle. So then we can talk about the coordinate system. The proposition is that there exists a directional map from the lower unipotent radical modeled by the uh, Cartan subgroup or the mass or the torus. So this this uh, 
quotient is the model by the conjugation. So there's a birational map from u mod h to configuration given by the following uh, formula. <coughs> so one way to think about g mod b also is a collection of borels of groups. Then this is the borels of group, this is the borels of group, and this is defined by conjugation by u and it is still a Borisov group. So this is a collection of free Borisov group and it lies here up to the g action. So another coordinate system also uh, is available for the a side. So a side has a similar uh, description. So configuration of a is g mod g mod u. So on the a side, there's a partial map. So this time it is given by H cross B bar and B, B minus to conversion A. And this is given by H and B. So H is the diagonal matrix. And here we need to have the <coughs> unipotent map and matrix. And it is given by this formula. So remember for the A, which is the G mod U. So to describe an element of G mod U, what we really do is to describe a collection of vectors. A collection of vectors, and then we just care about the wedge product of this collection of vectors. And so you can represent this collection of vector in a column way, in a column and then they will form a unipotent subgroup. <coughs> so you can you should view these elements as column uh, as as matrix where the columns gives you those uh, bases better. And those basis column vectors should be invariant under the action of this U bar. Yeah, let me let me just write. So I mean each element this corresponds to a collection of vectors invariant the by this by this thing. <clears throat> and then we just care about the vector product of these vectors. I mean, such such that the wedge product is invariant under this, under this map. All right, so we have two birational map for the configuration B and configuration A. Then it is natural to see that the positive structure. on u bar and h cross b which we know from for the u bar we know from the actually the first lecture the principle of fine space we have the description by the minus and we also have the description of b bar by the double bruha cells actually it's just a diagonal matrix so everything is positive if it is positive so the positive structure on this uh, space will induce the positive charts on this configuration base space. <clears throat> and in particular, we can now restrict to the configuration A case because we have an explicit description of the B minus. B minus is really <clears throat> the, the open the big open cell of B minus is really the double bruha cell G of W0E, right? So the configuration of A actually is described by we know the generalized 
miners associated to this WSL G or W0 dot inside sitting inside the lower barrel low, lower barrel subgroup. So for now we will uh, focus on the A side because then we can utilize the previous lectures on double process cells to describe the describe the coordinate system. So one more additional information is the use of Peter Weil theorem. So this is a theorem in representation theory. It tells you that the regular function on G mod U, the principal affine space, is actually equivalent to the direct sum of <coughs> highest uh, dominant weight, highest weight, highest weight representation. Dominant, dominant weight. Lambda. So here we have G mod U and we have functions on G mod U and then we have the action of G on this function, right? I mean, either I think on the left and on the right. <coughs> so you have action on functions on G mod U. Then you can decompose this uh, action and then it turns out that the decomposition will give you the direct sum into the highest weight representations. In particular, the maximal torus of the Cartan subgroup X here, and then the Cartan subgroup X on the right hand side decomposition. Uh, this is actually how it is decomposed. And we can see that the action on each piece is given by the eigenvalues labeled by this dominant weight adding on each <coughs> element on X. So in particular, if we focus on the configuration space, which is G mod U with three copies, then the decomposition will be three copies of this uh, highest weight representation. And because configuration space also is taking the G in variant, so we also take the G in variant here. Right. So now we want to describe the cluster algebra structure, a cluster variety structure on configuration space, which really means that we want to describe the cluster coordinates associated to the regular functions on configuration A. <coughs> and not surprisingly, then what we, uh, what what the coordinate will uh, consist of will be the generalized minors. <coughs> associated to this B minus part. So now let's uh, focus on the case of type AN, which corresponds to G equals SLM plus one. And we will see how we can extract functions belonging to these pieces of G invariants. So let's focus on type AN, where G is SLN plus one. So we consider three principal flags. So A1. So remember for principal affine space or the principal flag bundle, we are really interested in the wedge product of the vectors because we want to have a basis for the space as well as the size of the basis vector. So this is the flag information. So it will be the wedge product of successive, a successive wedge product of the basis. So we have three flags, so I'll use UVW to 
to denote them. So we have three flags. <coughs> now I define the following function. So this function is called xij, uh, x of ijk, and it is a function in three flags. And what we did is just taking the wedge product of the first i vector of the first flag, and then the j vector on the second flag, and then the k vector on the third flag. And we require that i plus j plus k equals one, or uh, equals n. Oh, sorry. So here I'm using SLN instead. So maybe type by m minus one. Yeah. So I mean, this these are all in C C N. Right? Yeah. So if i plus j plus k is n, then this has n vectors in cn so this is canonically identified with a complex number or, or the scalar multiple of the canonical uh, form the determinant form <clears throat> so this is a function and it can be easily checked that this function it is a function in the configuration space so it should lies in here and it turns out that it lies in the correct copy so it lies in the space labeled by the fundamental weight. <clears throat> so where omega i, omega j, omega k are the fundamental weights. I fundamental weight. So I fundamental weight means that the weight let I mean the the weight <coughs> vector will be one zero zero or I mean one in the i position and zero otherwise is the basis of your weight letters. So there are few cases if all i j k is bigger than zero, then we call this the phase function. Because x i j k will depend on of all three facts, depend on all three flags. Yeah. So usually, I, as mentioned before, I will draw the flags like this. So this phase function will depend on all three flags and usually they will be labeled by vertex in the interior of the triangle. So that's why it's called phase function. And for some cases when the index has zero, for example, i equals zero, then zero j k will belong to one omega j. And because of the fact that j plus k has to be n, then we can also, instead of using the fundamental weight, we can use the dual weight uh, notation. So the dual weight is defined by the action of the longest element on your weight. So in type A, it will, it will be n plus one minus j. <coughs> right, so, these are all one-dimensional invariants. So these are all one-dimensional one invariants space and consists of only this function. So this, when the one of the index is zero, then we will call this edge function. And it will, lies, it will only depends on two flags and we will put the dot on the edge of this triangle. That's why it's called edge function. It does not depend on A1. It only depends on A2 and A3 for example. So there are three types of edge function corresponds to whether which index is zero. 
So these functions will be the cluster variables of our cluster variety. Right, so because remember what we want is to describe a cluster coding on this uh, ring of regular functions and these regular functions will be exactly the cluster coordinate that we want. <coughs> so I mentioned that we have a directional map from B minus to configuration A, say by ignoring the H. So we have U minus W omega, W zero bar u minus and b w zero bar u minus. So this gives you an embedding of b minus into the configuration of uh, a. So in particular, the positive structure from b minus should coincide with the positive structure on the configuration space that we have just defined through this cluster coordinates. So let's uh, describe this observation in the following proposition. <coughs> so we consider the restriction of the embedding by ignoring the H factor. So I'm sending this B to U bar, omega bar, U bar, and B. Then the positive chart of B bar is given by, as we all know, the generalized minors. So the generalized minor is given by the following formula, UL omega I omega I, where UL is the truncated words of the longest element. Okay, so this is not a proposition yet, this is just observation. <coughs> so this is the content in chapter 10 or chapter 11. So in the case of SL4, if I choose this to be my longest element, then the truncated word will be S1, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, and 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1. And you can see here, oops, what, 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 what is that? S1, S3. Acting on the corresponding fundamental weight. So this quiver is exactly the quiver of the double product cells for G of omega zero E without the dotted arrows. So the dotted arrows here is included so that we will have a compatible gluing later on with other triangles. But first just ignore these dotted arrows. Then the mutable part is exactly the part that we have discussed previously in part three of the course. So this is the positive structure of the lower Borel subgroup. Then the claim now is that the restriction of our xijk function onto the image of this b bar b minus inside the configuration space should coincide with the value of this generalized minor. And this is indeed the case. So it's IJK and it restricts to the image of this lower bar part is exactly given by those minors. So here K is the same K as this K, while SIL is the Jth occurrence of SK in omega zero. So for omega for, for W zero or omega zero, for W zero you have 
a product of S and you count the jth occurrence of the kth index and this will be your L, the index L for this L here. So in particular, we know that there's a general formula because this is nothing. If you choose, if we choose the standard represent uh, standard choice of W zero, then this is nothing but taking the initial minus of your matrix given given like this. So you have a uh, consecutive a uh, cave consecutive. Uh, Row, uh, columns <clears throat> and this is the initial minor so let's see what is the image of xijk uh, what, what is the value of xijk under this image so remember for this configuration element what we are re really taking is the basis vector that is in invariant under multiplication on the left by say umar and this W0 bar and so on. So we need to choose a basis. And here we can choose the flag, oh, the principal flags as follows. So if I choose U bar to be represented by the following vector, So I call this I, the first flag, truncate the I, the I, the first I vector. <clears throat> right, so you can see that, I mean, this corresponds to uh, vectors that looks like this one. And looks like this. And it is invariant under multiplication by lower triangular matrix. The rest product. So if I choose this to be my uh, vectors, then this will be given by the standard vectors. So this I call J. And then this will be given by just the standard wedge, which I call the K. So here, the V will be the columns of the B matrix. <clears throat> Again, so given the flag, we need the collection of wedge products. So here, U bar will be having the collection given by EN and then EN minus one wedge EN and then EN minus two wedge E minus N minus one wedge EN and so on. So there are N of them. And because we are evaluating our flags on X, I, J, K. So remember, we just need to take the first I of them. And so this will be the first I uh, wedge. This will be the first J wedge of this flag, and this will be the first k wedge of this flag. So the value of xijk is exactly the wedge of this three sets. And then one can easily calculate that this is nothing but the generalized minor evaluated on B. So this is exactly <coughs> the same function that we have when we do the restriction on B. So this, this is really a proof. <coughs> okay, so this is good. So at least we know now that the XIJK function coincides with the natural positive structure arising from B minus. 
So now we need still need to uh, understand how the frozen variables are related with <coughs> the Poisson structure. And this comes from the requirement that the A variety and the X variety has to be compatible under the natural projections. So remember that there's a natural map from A to X induced by the monomial transformation from the last lecture. Then the observation is that a rational function on the configuration space of A can descend to a regular function on the configuration space of B if and only if it is in the 0, 0, 0 graded pieces of this decomposition of configuration of F of A. <coughs> so this means that if my cluster variable AJ lies in these graded pieces, then the F1 IJ has to satisfy according to this formula. It has to satisfy that the summation of the grade of all the cluster variables a cluster A variables has to be zero. Summing over uh, for, for all non-frozen rotors I. Right, so if we want this to be a well-defined regular function on the X space, the configuration B space, then we need this to have grade zero zero zero. And this descends to this formula here for each I. And so this gives us a restriction on the choice of these uh, arrows or the Poisson structure or the cluster variety structure or whatever structure. And with this, we can finally draw the diagram of the cluster and it looks like this, which is a very nice N triangulation of your N triangulation of your triangles. N triangulation. So these x variables will be the function, the phase function, oops, the phase function and the edge function. <coughs> and each of the function lies in the corresponding uh, G invariant pieces. And the cluster variety structure will be given by this uh, quiver. So, with this triangle, with the cluster coordinate associated to this triangle, as mentioned, we can now glue different triangles with the same cluster structure and build up the coordinate system for the whole surface. So as an example, if I want to understand the cluster algebra structure, on a square. So a square is a <coughs> four puncture, uh, four, a disc with four mark points. So the triangulation is just uh, two triangles glued together. Then naturally we have this diagram here. Right. So this is the left hand part will be the uh, cluster variety for a triangle. Now we take two copies and we glue together. And when we glue together, we see that the arrows here will be cancelled out because originally you have the dotted arrows going this way. So dotted arrows means half. Yeah, I didn't say dotted arrow means half the edge. So dotted means epsilon is one half. So originally we have the dotted arrows here, and on the other copy. We have the dotted arrow going this side. So when you glue, 
you defrost the boundary vertex and then you remove the I mean you cancel the opposite arrows. So this will be the final uh, quiver giving you the cluster variety structure of a square. Yeah, so the X and remember the X and A address share the same quiver as the information. So another example, which is more interesting, is the cluster variety structure on a disk with one puncture and two mark points. So for this, we can build a triangulation like this. So this is a triangulation because you have one edge, two edge, three edge. On the left hand side, you have one edge, two edge, three edge for the right hand side. So this really is a <coughs> triangle with two sides glued. It. So the picture looks something like this, right? So if you glue the two sides of the triangle, Then you will get the triangulation for the puncture disk with two mark points. And the result thing quiver will look something like this. <laughs> and this quiver is particularly important because it gives you the quantum torus algebra associated to the embedding of quantum groups. So in this case, we actually have an embedding of the quantum group SLN into the quantum torus algebra defined by this quiver. I mean, up to up to some up to some quotient. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah, and then this will be related to <coughs> uh, the positive representations of quantum groups, uh, and it is generalized to arbitrary rank. So we observe that for SLN. This triangle actually has some C3 symmetry, right? But it turns out that type A is quite a special case. So the arbitrary type is worked out for other other types. So in a example, so this quiver will correspond to type B3 where the word is chosen to be this. And here, because type B3 is non simplest so we actually have multiplier. So this multiplier is either one or two, and which is labeled in the notes. So correspond to the short, uh, long and short roots. So each label will tells you the weight, the multiplier. Of the quiver. So this is a generalized quiver with weights basically. So you can see that for higher type there is not really a C3 symmetry but then the idea is still the same. You can still piece up different triangle to get the higher type meta theory for type arbitrary algebraic group G. Uh, let's say uh, with simple D types and then it is also known that Flipping of triangles will correspond to flipping of the quiver as well. I mean the quiver mutation as well. All right, so <clears throat> yeah, this is a very brief overview. So I still suggest you to try look up the literature, although the text may be quite dense. So good luck to that. And so this concludes all the course materials I have prepared for the introduction to cluster algebra in this semester. So this is a really hot research area with many new directions and open problems. So most recently in the application of mathematical physics and mirror symmetries, uh, based on this work on Funk and Gontroff, as well as some combinatorics and representation theory. So I hope after this course, you are equipped with the necessary background knowledge in order to pursue the research literatures in cluster algebra for your future academic career. So thank you very much all for your attention and I hope you enjoy this course as much as I do.